Last week we left off talking about uh, providential history, and I want to I want to start off by reviewing a little bit of what providential history means, and that's one of the distinctives of the principal approach. And then we're going to get into specifically America's uh, Christian heritage. So I wanted to start off with well, this book is called America's Godly Heritage. It's written by David Barton. Have you ever heard of David Barton? And Wall Builders is the organization. Wall Builders, they took that name from Nehemiah, where the, the Jews were rebuilding the wall. So they've taken that to, to uh, as their mantle to rebuild America's foundation, to, to draw people's attention back to our Christian uh, history and our heritage. So Wall Builders is a great organization. Their website has all kinds of really good resources. Uh, David Barton has written a number of books. They've produced a number of videos. And so uh, he's... He is kind of like, he, he's, he's the history nerd's history nerd. Their, their company has, uh, they're headquartered in Texas, and he has hundreds, if not thousands, of historical artifacts. He collects newspapers from the colonial era and, and, and pastors' sermons. And the most obscure things you can think of, historical artifacts, but that really informs a lot of the research that they do. They know what was going on back during that time because they have made that their, their organization's mission to really get into those primary source documents. So this book is a really, it's a really good pamphlet, and I just wanted to read a little bit to you. Um, he says, there are so many things that we, l that we no longer hear today. For example, we are now told that our founding fathers were atheists, agnostics, or deists. But consider this statement by John Adams. The gener John Adams said, the general principles on which the, f the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. I will avow that I then believed and now believe that those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God. John, Qu John Adams' son, John Quincy Adams, uh, in his speech on July 4th, 1837, uh, he, sp he said to the crowd, Why is it that next to the birthday of the Savior of the world, your most joyous and venerated festival returns on this day, on the 4th of July? Is it not that, is it, is it not that in the chain of human events, the birthday of the nation is indissolubly linked with the birthday of the Savior? that it informs a leading event in the progress of the gospel dispensation? Is it not that the Declaration of Independence first organized the social compact on the foundation of the Redeemer's mission upon earth? That it laid the cornerstone of human government upon the first precepts of Christianity. John Jay, another founding father, said, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. You'll hear me talk about this tonight, and we'll really dig into it next week when we talk about the Christian form of our government. Every religion and or worldview has a political system that goes with it. Every religion and every worldview has a political system that goes with it. And finally, in his farewell address, George Washington pointed out that that the, two thou I'm sorry, that the two foundations for political prosperity in America were religion and morality, and that no one could be called an American patriot who attempted to separate politics from its two foundations. This is from George Washington. He said, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars. So providential history is really important uh, because in our particular case as Americans, our country has a rich Christian heritage and it is, not, it, it is being actively assaulted and has been for a few decades now. It used to be subtle and now it's pretty overt. So tonight, we're going to gain an understanding of providential history, and then we're going to move in to talk an, about America's Christian heritage. So let's review. Providential history, we read this last week from Reverend Fulgem. He said, the more thoroughly a nation deals with its history, the more decidedly will it recognize and own and own an overruling providence therein, and the more religious a nation will it become. 
while the more superficially it deals with its history, seeing only secondary causes and human agencies, the more irreligious it will be, will it be. So to review, most historians who wrote before 1900 viewed history from a providential view. Most young Christians want to have a goal toward which they can work with God's help. They want to have a purpose and a hope, and this requires being taught to see the providential hand of God in their lives. I, I wrote this down in my notes, it's not up there, but Christianity views history as needing to be studied from the whole to the part, from creation to the present and to the individual event. So we go from the whole to the part. A humanist view of history is studied, history is studied in fragments and in parts without realizing the connections of one part to another. So neglecting to teach America's history from a providential view, which sadly has been the case for nearly 100 years in our nation, leads the citizenry into a non-Christian or secular interpretation of history, and it leaves it without hope for a future. This neglectful approach is a superficial approach. It is today's social studies approach, and the result is to make us an irreligious people. Our students are unable to see that all history is related to the unfolding of his story, God's story, of liberty, both internal and external, and both religious and civil. Rosalie Slater said that the failure to recognize the importance of the providential approach has resulted in educating Christians who live in two worlds, a spiritual world and a secular world. This was not the way of the pilgrim who lived in one world, the world created by God, ruled and directed by God for God's purposes and glory. If you remember, my f the first night I explained Dr. Meyer's uh, vision for, for starting Day Spring, and, and part of his story is that he, he grew up with his view. He grew up that there was a sacred part of life, and then there was a secular, there was the rest of life. The sacred part of life is where we go to church, and we do family devotions, and we, we do the things that we know are right as Christians, and, and it's sort of compartmentalized then over in this part of my life, and then I have the rest of my life to do all the other things. And, and that was one of the revelational things that God gave to him was that, that there is no sacred secular dichotomy. It's all sacred. It all belongs to God. And, and, and studying history from a providential view helps to reinforce that to our students. It presents the whole view of, of history from eternity's perspective and answers for the student of history who? It's God and his sovereignty and his purposes. What? It's the events, the individuals, and the nations, where geography, that's the, state, the stage for man's activities, and why it's all about the gospel. It's all about the message of the good news of Jesus Christ and the message of liberty. So let's talk about that. If you have your, uh, t your Christian history timeline, Christian education timeline, these are the 10 links of the Christian history timeline. How many of you have seen these 10 links in your child's classroom? Every classroom has these 10 links, okay? Now, there's nothing necessarily sacred about these 10 links. There are many other things that we could have put on this, but this is the one that we use when it comes to understanding uh, some of the specifics about, you will often also hear this referred to as the chain of Christianity moving westward. So if you can kind of picture Israel and the Middle East in your mind, as the gospel moves westward, I'm reading in my, in my personal devotions the book of Acts right now, and I, this morning was just the chapter about uh, Saul and Peter. He hadn't become Paul yet, but they went to Antioch, and they were taking the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles, and Antioch was the first place where Christians got the name Christian. That's where they were first called Christians. Antioch is in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. So the gospel continued to move westward, well, from where you're sitting, westward uh, into what is now Europe, and then, and then the chain of Christianity continues to move westward. And, and here's something that's, that really cannot be uh, overstated. At the very top and at the very bottom, you have eternity past and you have eternity future. I don't, I don't think we can talk about this enough with our children that God stands outside of time. And he is infinite, and we are finite. And what that means is that everything that happens in human history happens because he is fulfilling his purposes. 
he created mankind. There was a beginning date for mankind. And spiritually, there will be no end date to mankind because, of, because that's part of God's plan. So whatever part of that en en encompasses America's history is part of God's plan. But what that does for the individual student is it helps to reinforce the doctrine that God is sovereign and he has a plan for my life. I'm not just a number. I'm not just one of the billions of people that will have lived. I'm an individual created by God. And just as God has been unfolding his plan for all of humankind, if I understand that on a big level, I can understand that at a, at a smaller level and know that God has a plan for me. Does that make sense? Questions, thoughts? I just, like to th I, just, I just like to picture God with this timeline and he's outside of time and he, he kno like, I don't know, I get a little bit sci-fi with it. Does he, does, he work chrono like, does he work chronologically with where we are now in the 21st century? Or is, is it all happening at the same time? Those are, these are the things that my mind wonders because God is infinite and we're not. We, there's lots that we don't just, just can't understand. But anyway, all right. So <laughs> the 10 links here on the timeline. We have creation. This is the fall of man. Uh, we have Moses and the law, God giving uh, the, the children of Israel his law. We have Jesus, Jesus Christ is the focal point of history. Some of the timelines might actually say Jesus Christ, the focal point of all history. So everything that is before Christ leads up to Jesus coming to the earth. That's God's salvation plan for man. And everything after Christ, yeah, this microphone's moving around. It's my, it's my jacket. Might have to just take it off. I think it keeps pulling the cord. Um, everything after Christ is all about the gospel and bringing salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's, that's, the, that's the Christian history timeline when it comes to the overall narrative of humanity. As we zoom into America, we see a direct connection between the gospel moving westward and the gospel coming to America and America's founding. There's a direct connection. The Bible is translated into English. Uh, around, uh, shortly after that time period, we have the Age of Exploration that's represented on the timeline by Christopher Columbus. And he brings, the, he brings the gospel to the New World, and then the other explorers do as well. We have the Christian founding of our country. We have the, uh, the American Christian Republic and the founding of our country. We have the expansion and the growth of America, which allows the gospel to be taken all the way uh, to the west coast and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. America used to be the number one missionary sending country in the world. I don't think we are anymore. I want to say South Korea might be. I could be wrong about that. But America, I if, if we are, we're not very far in the lead by, by much. But we used to be the number one missionary sending country in the world. Uh, and then we get to um, the, the restoration link is, is the present day. So and what we do here at school is, in the elementary grades, each grade gets one of these links, and they really dive into that for, for that particular year. So first grade, let's say, gets the creation link. They're learning the days of creation, and, and, and they're learning about God's plan for mankind, Adam and Eve's sin. The second grade, they'll focus on the Moses and the law. And so by the time they get through elementary school, they've gotten most of the links of the timeline. And then as we get into the upper school, we begin focusing in a little bit more on certain areas. Uh, and we, we have a whole history curriculum. If you ever want to see how it's laid out, the scope and sequence from, from first grade all the way through 12th, you can come in any time and we can show you, show you what we do. All right? So the 10 links of the, of the timeline help, uh, help us always analyze uh, how men are governed. We really focus in on how men are governed during this time. So if you, if you look at the difference between Moses and the law, and Jesus Christ became, uh, you know, came and fulfilled the law, and then the Bible being translated, into, and, and the Bible being translated into English, by the way, is, is also, um, it, it really means the Bible being translated into the common language, into the common language of the people. So when Luther worked on a German translation of the Bible, when, um, my mind's going blank. I'm thinking of all the different English-speaking people, Scottish and the Irish. That was all English. But Luther's a good example. So it's the Bible in the common language for the people. Okay? Um, so we, we look at how men are governed, and we look at how did God use individual character to forward his purposes. Okay? So a few, a few final points here about, the cr about providential history. 
uh, and the Christian History Timeline. It's a tool for teaching the providential hand of God in our history. It traces the flow of liberty for the individual from the internal to the external. And we'll talk about that a lot next week when we talk about the, form of our, the Christian form of our government. Uh, and, and one of the main principles here, we're always going from internal to external. It shows the chain of Christianity moving westward through time. It focuses on key individuals, key documents, and key events. As I said, there's nothing sacred about those 10 links, but they are a, a useful teaching tool for our purposes. They provide pockets into which that we can place the rest of history, and they provide springboards into other areas of history and or other subjects. So something that you will see, like our chemistry teacher will talk about uh, the timeline of chemistry, and, and he will highlight the different chemists who made breakthrough discoveries and experimentations. And so we, we do timelines a lot here. We talk about you know, the history timeline, but our math teachers and our, our science teachers, our music teachers will talk about the timeline of their subject and they bring that in. And so each time we do that, we're reinforcing that the, the, the story of humanity is the story of God's redemption and that as God redeems his people, then they, they take that freedom and that liberty and then they do things with it. They, they write music, and music develops over, the, over the, the centuries. They develop scientific research and, exp and, and discoveries, and that develops over the centuries. Does that make sense? So that's how we use the timeline uh, very generally, but then we also do it very specifically as we get into the older grades. All right? I want to connect uh, for a few minutes here the, the providential history to the seven principles of the principal approach. So I'm kind of linking this back to the, the very first week where I, I briefly overviewed what those seven principles are. So the first principle is God's principle of individuality. Everything in God's universe is revelational of God's infinity, God's diversity, and God's individuality. So we're able to expand on that principle when we teach from a providential view. Number two, the Christian principle of self-government. Government must first be internal and then external. This is true for the individual, it's true for the family, it's true for the community, it's true for the nation. So no matter what period of history we're studying, we're taking a look at what was the role of government during that time. How did people govern themselves? How was their society governed? And most of human history, it's the rule by the, it, it's the, rule by the powerful. And we're studying about this external form of government, and then we can contrast that with Christianity, where the churches of the colonial era were governed through self-rule, and then that translated into the idea of self-rule for the political arena as well. Number three, America's heritage of Christian character. America has a rich uh, heritage of Christian founding, which includes a gospel purpose, the founding of a Christian self-government, and the value of the individual. The fourth principle, conscience is the most sacred of all property. I, I, I reviewed this a little bit, and I looked it up. This Remember, these red books are some of the the main resources we have for the principal approach. So this one is the Christian history of the Constitution of the United States. And this, this quote here, this principle that conscience is our most sacred property comes from a writing by James Madison. So I'm gonna read that to you. He talks about property here. Uh, this is an essay he wrote in 1792. So he's a congressman at this time. He said, property in the former sense, a man's land or merchandise or money is called his property. In the latter sense, a man has a property in his opinions and the free communication of them. I want you to hear this in the context of what we've been through the past couple of years. I'm going to read that last sentence again and then I'll keep going. A man has a property in his opinions and in the free communication of them. He has a property of peculiar value in his religious opinions and in the profession and practice dictated by them. He has an equal property in the free use of his faculties and free choice of the objects on which to employ them. Free market. I just, that's my editorial. In a word, as a man is said to have a right to his property, he may be equally said to have a property in his rights. Where an, ex where, where an excess of power prevails, property of no sort is duly respected. No man is safe in his opinions, his person, his faculties, or his possessions. Where there is an excess of liberty, the effect is the same. Government is instituted to protect the property of every sort, this being the end of government. Conscience is the most sacred of all property. Other property, depending in part on a positive law, 
and he goes on and on. But that's where, the, that's where that phrase comes in, that conscience, so he's, he's outlining the different kinds of property, and then that's where we get that phrase, that conscience is our most sacred property. Do you have any thoughts or questions about that? That's a phrase, yeah, go for it. Can I ask you to, can I ask you to use the microphone? Can, can you hand that back for me? Thank you. I just wanted to, who, who wrote that? James Madison. Uh-huh. And in what was the... It's an essay. That's an excerpt from an essay. He was writing about property, generally speaking. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, no, I could say a lot about it, but I won't destroy okay. it. Okay. <laughs> All right. You just keep the microphone there. You just set it on the table for me. Thanks. Okay. And by the way, conscience, someone challenged me on this recently. Conscience, that word here in this context can be interchanged with, with worldview and beliefs. So that, that's, a, that's a set, an 18th century way of phrasing it, but what we want our students to understand is that what you believe is your most sacred property. Your worldview and your core beliefs, that is your most sacred property and no one can take that from you. Does that make sense? So if you need to interchange conscience with my worldview, my beliefs, my convictions, if that's helpful to you, that's, that's, that's the broader meaning of what that phrase means. All right, the Christian form of our government, number five, each religion or worldview has a form of government and a, a constitutional republic comes from a Christian worldview. We're really gonna dig into that next week. Number six, how the seed of local self-government is planted. That's the sixth principle. Um, government must be first internal and then external. Self-rule must work its way up from the bottom and not the other way around. And this is another one we're gonna be talking about next week when we talk specifically about the Christian form of our government. That, that idea of local self-government, every other government before the United States was established, it was a rule from the top down. America it has its founding in the idea that I govern myself, our family has a structure of, of governance that we operate by, my church has a structure of governance, my community has a structure of governance, my state, my country. So we work from the individual and we bring it out to the external. And then finally, the Christian principle of American political union. We must have union with unity. Okay? So, that's a little bit of uh, just some more background here on uh, providential history. Now, I'm going to talk tonight about America's Christian heritage. So, this is, I, I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to make this one lesson because a lot of what I'm going to talk about, we usually unfold over weeks and months in our history courses. So I'm going to be like spraying you with a fire hose, uh, and you're going to try to drink from that, and I'm going to do my best. So wha when I think about Ameri the phrase America's Christian heritage, um, y books have been written, documentaries have been made, uh, the, the volumes are numerous that, that you could find to f evidence that Christianity was the prevalent worldview at the time of our founding. What I'd like to do then is pick a few examples tonight that will help illustrate that for you um, because these are some of the most inspiring stories that we have that kind of uh, help us as Americans to say, wow, I, I don't deserve to, I mean, this, being able to live in this country it truly is a gift. We do have a rich heritage. So the pilgrims, are probably our, uh, our, our first, are definitely our first example. So, if you've never come to Thanksgiving Exposed, you need to come to Thanksgiving Exposed. It's November 21st. In fact, you should probably volunteer to be in Thanksgiving Exposed. Some of you already have. Thanksgiving Exposed is what we do here. It, it, it's, uh, it's a walkthrough reenactment of the Pilgrim story. So we convert this auditorium we in, into that Christian history timeline. So people walk through here and we set, you know, we do staging and there's actors um, and you don't have to be a great actor. If you're a man and you can grow a beard, we will use you, okay? We'll give you lines, you just have to say them, okay? You don't even have to do that good of a job acting. All right, anyway. Um, but we go through, we, we then convert several of the classrooms and we walk through the Pilgrim story and there are, there are several key scenes here in the Pilgrim story. So let me just give you kind of a brief overview here of the Pilgrims. They were people in, in 16th and 17th century England, 
So to give you some context here, the, the Protestant Reformation was happening, uh, and w which, was, which was the time where the Catholic Church had become very corrupt, and some people began to try to reform the church. They, they, they began reading the Bible for themselves. So on the Christian history timeline, we start off with the Bible in English, and we begin looking at how these, these martyrs of the faith, William Tyndale, John Wycliffe, John Huss, they began uh, reading the Bible for themselves, and they began convicted that what the church was telling the, the masses of people was not correct. And so one particular group then who began to read the Bible for themselves, they become known as the pilgrims, but first they were meeting in Scrooby, England. They met in, pri in a private home of William Brewster, and Bradford tells us in his journal that they shook off the yoke of anti-Christian bondage and they formed together into a civil body politic and there they began to uh, enjoy the reading and studying of God's word together. The problem was it was illegal. They were breaking the law. You had to attend the Church of England. There was a state church and that was the only option for you. So they were breaking the law. After a few years of this and several, several prison uh, sentences and lots of fines that they had to pay, they had heard that there was freedom of religion in Holland. And they went to Holland and they lived there for about 12 years and their congregation grew to about 300 people. So there was this pocket of English people living in Holland. They enjoyed great freedom of religion, but the problem in Holland was that they, th these, these people were farmers in England and they were living in an industrial city. And so they, they couldn't do any farming. They had, to, they had to pick up industrial jobs for very low wages. A lot of the children had to work to help bring in the income for the family. So that was very difficult for them. But their most, pressing, their most pressing concern, and tell me if this sounds familiar or is in any way analogous to where we are today with our children. When you have a society that has freedom of religion, there also can be corruption that creeps in and influences the children. It's, it's an interesting, it's interesting thing, I think, for us as, as Americans in the 21st century who are raising children, because obviously we're very grateful to live in a country where we have freedom of religion, right? But with the freedom of religion comes the freedom for all other kinds of influences. And how many of you find the struggle to be significant to keep your children on the straight and narrow when they're being bombarded with everything that the world is telling them. And I don't care what you do, you can, you can not give them phones, you can keep them off the computers, you can, you can even try to sequester them in your house and shelter them as much as you want, but they live in the real world and they're going to be exposed to those things and they're going to be influenced by those things. And it was a deep concern for the pilgrims. They were living in Scrooby and their children were becoming Dutch. And the Dutch culture was very, uh, very unchristian. And so they, they had hard labor. They had a difficult time uh, making ends meet financially. Um, the, and, and they were very concerned for their children, but the Lord was continuing to bless them. They had, God's, they had God's blessing on them this whole time. Their congregation continued to grow, and, uh, but they decided maybe it's time to, maybe it's time to find uh, a, a, another solution. And so they began looking at America. We can't go back to England because what we need to do there, what we, the way that we believe we need to live our lives is illegal. Uh, we can't stay here for, th for all the other reasons. And so they began looking at coming to America. And here's the most amazing thing to me. They, they set their sights on America. They began to go through the process of getting permission from the king, getting all the, all the, all the financial backing. They, they joined themselves to a, a joint stock company, a merchant adventurers who funded their voyage, and they were going to pay them back with the first seven years of their proceeds in the new colony. And as they were preparing to leave, they encountered hardship after hardship after hardship. And I don't know, some, this always challenges me. I used to teach this every year to the ninth graders, and then we would go on the, on the trip up to Boston. And it challenged me every year that I taught it. Like, so a lot of times we, I, at least I do, you know, when I'm, when I'm seeking the Lord's will about something, I think, oh, well, if things are going my way, that's a confirmation of God's will. And so when things begin to not go your way, you begin to question, oh, wait, God, what are you doing? Am I not in your will? Am I not doing what you wanted me to do? If so, why is this financial hardship hitting me? Or why are these health issues happening? Or why is this, why is this, this turmoil happening in my family? You know, you begin looking at these external circumstances and, you, and you, it, it causes me at least sometimes to question, okay, Lord, am I missing something? 
I thought I was doing what you wanted me to do. The pilgrims, the, the first boat they got leaked. They, a, as they were about to leave, they found out they had been swindled by the merchants that they had joined together. For, they, they indentured themselves for seven years, and then once it was too late, they realized that they had been swindled. But it was too late to back out now. They had sold all their goods. They'd sold everything. I'm probably going to have to get the handheld at some point. This is really starting to irritate me. No. I'll, I'll, I'll go a little longer. It's probably not irritating anybody but me. Um, so, thank you. It's my ADD. See, it's just flopping around. Yeah, I'll tape it. Come on, you can tape me. So, I'll talk about the pilgrims while you come up with the tape. Um, they... Th they found that they've been swindled. They and then and then they get the voyage. They they're leaving months late. They they get on the Mayflower. They're coming over and the it's 66 days of being in the in the belly of a ship that's not a passenger ship. They're the human cargo. It's airtight. There's no light. You can't light a candle. It's a wooden ship. You've got seasickness. You have bodily functions. You have chickens and pigs and goats down there with you. It was. It sounded pretty miserable. And I would think, all right, I'll pause. Okay. Thank you. Um, they, but, but they continued, they continued on. And they, they knew that the Lord had called them to do this. And, and they continued to, to move forward. Um, one of the reasons was, Bradford said that they had a great hope and an inward zeal that they had of laying some good foundation, or at least to make some way thereunto, for the propagating of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world. Yea, though they should be but even as stepping stones unto others for the performing of so great a work. I mean, these people, stepping stones, that's literally laying down so that people can walk on me. That's literally laying down so that I will, I, will, I will be the, the body that goes down to be a stepping stone to someone else so that they can go after me and do the next, take the next step. Um, they get to the New World just in time for winter. New England winter. Once again, God, did we do the right thing here? Half of their number die in that first winter. Half of their number. They... And on top of that, the entire winter, while they're, when they're burying their own dead in shallow graves, which they're doing at night because they don't want the Native Americans to know how many of them have died. The Native Americans, they can see them. They, they see glimpses of them. They see shadows. They hear them. They know they're out there, and they don't know if they're hostile or friendly, and they're dying, and they're becoming weaker and weaker, and they have that fear looming over them the entire time. And the the most remarkable thing about all of that is that they, they make it 51, 102 passengers, 51 of them die in the first winter. They make it to the spring. The Mayflower goes back to England. The captain of the ship begs them to get back on board with him and go. He, he lists the things that, that all the reasons why they should go back. The, y your first ship leaked. The voyage was terrible. We arrived in time for winter. There was no food. Half of your number have died. We don't, still don't know what the Native Americans are going to do with us once we encounter them. This has been a failure. Get on the boat with me and let's go back to England. Cut your losses. At least you won't have died. Not a single one of them got on the Mayflower to go back. Not one. I don't know if I could have done that. They wrote the Mayflower Compact. The Mayflower Compact... What happened was they had been blown off course. They were supposed to land in Virginia. If they had landed where they were supposed to, they would have been the first settlers of what is today New York City. They were supposed to go to the mouth of the Hudson River. They were blown off course. So they landed in a place where there was no government to, to, um, to guide them as to what they should do. So they gathered together. This is before the first winter. So when, when all 102 passengers were still on the Mayflower, they, the men gathered together, and, they, and, and some of them were saying, we're going to go off and do our own thing. We're going we're gonna to make our own way. And 
the rest of them got together and they said, no, we have, to, we have to band together if we're going to survive, and they wrote the Mayflower Compact. And the Mayflower Compact, uh, any third grade parents in here? Any, okay, any other, any, any fourth grade or fifth grade, or if you had a third grade or more recently? Okay. Um, third grade goes to Plymouth, they memorize the Mayflower Compact. Ninth grade goes to Plymouth, and we also go to Boston as well and learn some of the other stories I'm going to tell. But the Mayflower Compact then really becomes one of the, it, it's one of the first pieces of government, and, and it really sets the stage for this idea of a compact theory of government. It really just says, we are, are joining together into a civil body politic for the, for the glory of God and for king and country. We are going to agree that we will choose leaders from among ourselves, and whoever, gets, whoever wins the vote, we're going to follow that person. We're all going to agree to live together. And that, that really is something that our founding fathers then a, a couple generations later would look back to, and John Locke would write about that. John Locke is the, uh, is the philosopher of the American Revolution, the Enlightenment philosopher, and he writes about this idea that if, that if a, a group of people living together with no other authority over them, th they have to come together and everybody has to sacrifice a little bit of what they would prefer to do for the good of the group, and then you come together and you join together into a civil body politic, and you agree to elect leaders from among yourselves and to follow what those leaders tell you, or what those leaders decide. And that came from their pastor, John Robinson. So, so there's, there's Christian teaching that informed, how th informed them of what to do in times of crisis. Okay, and then finally, uh, for the pilgrims, they made peace with the natives, and they, they did eventually contact the Native Americans. They made, pe they made a peace treaty with them. That peace treaty lasted over 50 years. William Penn did it right. William Penn and the Quakers did it right with the Native Americans, and the pilgrims did it right with the Native Americans. Plenty of other examples of people who did not do it right, but we have two shining examples of people whose Christian, whose Christian worldview led them to treat the Native Americans as image bearers of God just like they were and to do right by them. The children of, the, of, the, of William Bradford and Chief Massasoit would be the ones to go to war a few uh, uh, 50, 50 years later. But the pilgrims give us all kinds of wonderful examples um, and Here's a, here's a cool fact. 10% of the current U.S. population can trace their lineage back to one of the Mayflower passengers. 10%. There's a whole Mayflower society. You can research if you are one of the descendants of the Mayflower uh, passengers, one of the 51 who survived, which is even more remarkable. Um, and if you find out that you are, you can, you can pay a hefty uh, due to the Mayflower society and join the club kind of a cool thing. I'm not. I've, I've, I'm not a Mayflower descendant. But does anybody in here know that they are? Awesome. Did you pay the dues? Not yet. Yeah, no. John Alden. Okay. Awesome. So, th so the pilgrims are part of our heritage. They're, they're, we, we call it America's sacred story. That's why, we, that's why we tell the story. There's so much more that we go. We, we take weeks to unfold this story with our students, and when we, we go up to Plymouth with the parents, we, we, we talk a lot about it. There are so many other things I could say. But I'm going to read a, a few more words from William Bradford. He said, Thus out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things of nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand so the light here kindled hath shone unto many. Yea, even unto our whole nation, may the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. He also said, may not, may not and ought not the children of these fathers rightly say, our fathers were Englishmen which came over this great ocean and were ready to perish in this wilderness, but they cried unto the Lord and he heard their voice and looked on their adversity. Let them therefore praise the Lord because he is good and his mercies endure forever. Yea, let them, let them which have been redeemed by the Lord show how he hath delivered them from the hand of the oppressor when they wandered in the, in the desert wilderness out of the way and found no city to dwell in. Both hungry and thirsty, their soul was overwhelmed in them. Let them confess before the Lord his loving kindness and his wonderful works before the sons of men. And there's all kinds of information about how the pilgrims and the things that they did, they influenced the Puritans who came then and founded Massachusetts Bay Colony, and they had all kinds of influence that lasted into the founding generation. So the pilgrims are one of our, one of our great examples of our country's Christian heritage. So the providential planting of America, the hour of American colonization was the, was the fittest one in modern times 
for the new world to receive the best which the old world had to give. We were connected in time and space with the Reformation. It served as a bulwark and reserve for the Protestant church, and it was held there until there was a people of the book, the Bible obviously, sufficiently mature to build a civil government on biblical principles. That was high strategy in the warfare for the advancement of the kingdom of God on the, in the earth. That was C.B. Uh, Galloway. He's writing about Christianity in America and talking about how our continent and the timing of the Reformation, the Bible in English, the, there, there being a, a ready-made continent for the, for the next phase of human liberty, it, it was all part of God's plan. Alexis de Tocqueville. He's a Frenchman who wrote about America. So 1820s, America is fast growing into a, an economic power. We've come through the revolution, we've got our constitution, we've won the War of 1812, so we've beaten Britain twice now, and we are really becoming an, ec an economic power on the, on the same level as the European countries. We were the wonder of Europe. They didn't understand how this little country was becoming so influential and so powerful so quickly. Alexis de Tocqueville was a French jurist who came over to study this whole phenomenon. He spent months in America, traveling all over the place, meeting people, and then he wrote a, 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 like a 400, 500 page work called Democracy in America. He has some amazing quotes in that book that I put a few of them here in, in your notes. And, and I'm, I'm talking specifically about what he observed when it came to America's uh, religious nature. He said that uh, the greatest parts of English America were peopled by men who were escaping religious persecution and settled into a Christianity that described best as democratic and republican. He also said from the beginning, politics and religion were in accord, and they have not ceased to be so since. Next to each religion is a political opinion that is joined to it by an affinity. Separation of church and state is a very recent idea, and it's wildly misconstrued. And we'll get into that next week. I keep saying next week. Next week's a big week. Uh, I want to just go over a few of the colonial founding charters. Again, more evidence that we have Christian Christianity as a big, as the main influencer of our heritage. Virginia and Jamestown. This is from the charter that the king gave the men who were coming to found Jamestown. We greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may, by the providence of Almighty God, hereafter tend to the glory of his divine majesty in propagating of Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. This is from the charter for uh, the, the, co the colony of Virginia. Dedication day was April 29th, 1607. The first thing these men did when they landed on the shores of Virginia was they dedicated the continent to God and they had a solemn prayer service. If you go to that lighthouse there in that picture, that's of course a modern day picture, that lighthouse is there at Cape Henry in Virginia Beach, tucked away behind all the, all the, you know, the, the big stuff is this cross and it's a monument to the planting of the cross by Pastor Robert Hunt and the dedication of the North American continent to the glory of God and the propagation of the gospel. It's a cool place if you're ever in Virginia Beach, go look it up. More about colonial foundings. Nearly all of the original colonies had distinctly Christian purposes in their charters, and that was freedom of religion and evangelizing of the natives. I have here Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, the Carolinas, and Delaware, and I don't have time to read all of them to you, but all of them have either one or both of the recognition uh, that there needs to be freedom of religion and or the purpose of this colony is to propagate the gospel to the Native Americans. The, the, sometimes they're called um, savages, sometimes they're called, just references those that, y that yet lit, live in utter darkness, but there was a missionary purpose in the founding charters of m the majority of the 13 original colonies. Let's talk about colonial churches. Again, from Alexis de Tocqueville, he said, Christian morality is found in all sects, they all differ in their worship, but all agree on the duties of men toward one another. So more from, from the churches here. Uh, in New England, we had the Anglican Church. This was Puritan Church. This was established to be... Um, so we had the pilgrims that came in, to Plymouth in 1620. About 10 years later, there was a civil war in England, and the Puritans came. The Puritans were those that were trying to stay in the Church of England and purify it from 
uh, what they felt were, were Catholic rituals. So when King Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church, he made the Church of England, he made himself head of the Church of England, but there still was a lot of the, the same Catholic, uh, Catholic um, symbolisms, the, the, the way that they did communion, the way the preachers read from the Book of Common Prayer rather than preaching expositionally from the scripture, the, you know, the, the wearing of the robes, the, the liturgy, all the formality. There was still a lot of uh, Catholic, uh, a, a Catholic feel to the Anglican Church. The Puritans were trying to purify that and, and get, get the church to be what scripture calls the church to be. Uh, it wasn't going well for them in England, so they came to America, and they tried to set up a, a church in America that would be sort of a model uh, for, for the rest of the world, what they felt should be a model state church, okay? And that's John Winthrop in his famous City on a Hill, uh, where he, he gave the famous sermon about America should be uh, a shining city upon the hill. Um, that's where, by the way, we get our name for the beacon, because Boston was the... F was the was the founding city of the Massachusetts Bay Colony where the Puritans came and founded Boston. Beacon Hill is a neighborhood in Boston where the state capital sits. It's a very wealthy, ritzy neighborhood now. If you have a couple million dollars lying around and you wanna buy a 1,200 square foot townhouse in Beacon Hill, go for it. Um, but so Beacon Hill was, uh, was the, 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 the home of the Puritan church and um, yeah, so there's a little, little bit of history there. But the, the, the churches of New England were very Calvinistic. They were very scripture-based. They were similar to the separatists and the pilgrims, except that they believed in purifying the church from within. The congregationalists, these were the, what the pilgrims turned into. Um, they were the separatists whose main difference from Puritans was not having a central church. The Puritans would eventually become more like their congregational brothers in Plymouth. And there's a whole... Uh, story there about how the pilgrims then began to have more influence over the Puritans, who then were the ones who really were the, uh, the founders of the American Revolution, and so the religious beliefs that then uh, influenced the American Revolution. We don't have time to go into all that tonight. Churches in the middle and southern colonies, there were several different denominations. We had the Presbyterians, we had the Episcopalians, this was the mission uh, church plant of the Church of England. Uh, either civil authorities read from the Book of Common Prayer or the Church of England uh, would, s would appoint a minister. The Episcopalian Church would, would almost die out and during the Revolution because this was the official English church plant, and when we're fighting against England, it's not a very popular uh, congregation to be a part of. Of course, we know about the Quakers being here from Pennsylvania. Uh, William Penn founded Pennsylvania as a holy experiment. Uh, if you remember your Pennsylvania history from middle school, maybe, if you were in Pennsylvania then, it was to be a holy experiment where if you believed in God and you agreed to follow the laws, you could come live in Pennsylvania. You could be Quaker, you could be Mennonite, you could be Amish, you could be Baptist, you could even be Catholic. That was a joke, sorry. Okay, it's true, but... Um, all right, more quotes from de Tocqueville here. On the indirect influence of religious beliefs and how they, they exert on uh, political society. He said, the religious aspect of the country that first struck my eye was the first that struck his eye. As I prolonged my stay, I perceived the great political consequences that flowed from these new facts. Religion best teaches the art, I'm sorry, religion best teaches the American the art of being free. These are observations from a foreigner in the 1820s. He said, religion does not directly exert an influence on the laws or political opinions. Rather, it directs, moors, and regulates the family, which regulates the state. While the law permits them to do everything, religion prevents them from conceiving everything and forbids them to dare everything. And then religion never mixes directly in government of society, but it is the first of their political institutions for it facilitates their use of freedom. Some more. Uh, who, who can know what is in the heart of all Americans? But we can see that they all believe religion necessary to the maintenance of Republican institutions. He said, Americans confuse Christianity and freedom in their minds so that it is almost impossible to have them conceive of one without the other. Religious zeal constantly warms itself at the hearth of patriotism. We have an interest in the new states being religious so that they permit us to remain free. He said, despotism can do without faith, but freedom cannot. And finally, what makes a people master of itself 
if they have not submitted to God. And, th- and there's, one more, there's one more quote from de Tocqueville that I don't have in my PowerPoint. I, I, I think I still have it memorized. Let's give it a try. He, he talks about the, uh, the role of religion in America, and you, you've probably heard the tail end of this quote, but he says, I, I searched for the secret of America's greatness. I searched for the source of America's greatness, and I did not find it, and he lists several places. I didn't find it here. I didn't find it in their, in their politics. I didn't find it in their institutions. I didn't find it in their, eco- in their economy. I found it in the way in their churches, and he called it the, the flame of the, of, that came from the pulpit of the American churches. And then he went on to say that America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Have you ever heard that quote before? America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. So de Tocqueville had uh, a lot of, I think, very true things to say about what he observed as the role of religion only a few decades into our country. Um, to close out a little bit here on the, on the role of the church, I want to talk a little bit about the, the way the colonial American church is teaching. People were taught from the pulpit the biblical ideas of man and government. What are those biblical ideas? First of all, all men are created equal and in the image of the divine creator. Second of all, man is inherently sinful and needs salvation to have power, to have his wickedness checked. And that government is instituted by God to be our earthly authority with its own set of limits. Do you see the connection there between those Christian teachings and the founding of our country? I I don't think it's difficult to make the connection there. When when there's a, a whole nation of people, a few million people who, who have the general understanding that individuals have value because they're made in the image of God, that man is not basically good, man is inherently evil and sinful and needs redemption, and that government is supposed to have a limited role, and that government is supposed to protect the rights of the individual. When you have an entire country of people who have that general mindset I think it plays a role into how that country's government then is established when it's, g- when it's getting started from, from scratch. And that th- those teachings came, in part at least, from the churches uh, of this era. We had sermons as political pamphlets. They had these things called election sermons. They had election days. That wasn't like voting. That was like the election of the saints, like the Calvinist doctrine of predestination. So they had election days where they had whole days devoted to uh, uh, discussing that particular part of theology. We had artillery sermons. So these are, th- they were called artillery sermons, but we, a couple of examples there. A defensive war in a just cause is uh, sinless. That's the name of one of the sermons that was delivered by a pastor from Concord, Massachusetts, which became the site of one of our first battles in the American Revolution. So those people had been taught that uh, a defensive war is a just war, uh, the sin of cowardice. So just a couple of examples here of the types of sermons that today would be labeled as probably as political, but that was very commonplace back then. There, was f- there were fast days and Thanksgiving sermons in observance of victories, calamities, and special events, so that whether this was colonial legislatures, whether these were governors, or even some of the early proclamations from our presidents and our Congress, and I'm going to read a few examples to you in a little bit of, of like national or statewide days of fasting, humiliation, thanksgiving. So these were all very commonplace in the, uh, in the colonial churches. All right, before we get into a few examples, let's, just, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Great Awakening. Um, ben Franklin was an enthusiastic supporter uh, by printing many of George Whitfield's sermons. The Great Awakening combined with the Enlightenment played a role in the development of the, the democratic mindset of colonial America. So the Great Awakening is just what it sounds like. It was a religious revival that, s- that swept the nation. Uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people professed faith in Christ. This was about the 1730s and 1740s. So it's really the coming of age time for people like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, people of that generation who then, by the time we get into the revolution, are more uh, in their middle ages, okay? Uh, Here are some of the main teachings that come from the Great Awakening, and you can kind of see how they have their influence then on America's founding. Taught that the Bible espouses that all men are created equal. The true value of man lies in his moral behavior, 
rather than in his whatever class he happens to belong to, uh, that all men can be saved, that liberty of conscience is an inalienable right of every reasoning creature, that no one religious sect could unify the 13 colonies against Britain, but the shared Christian convictions regarding the nature of sin, the nature of virtue, and the divine providence did bring a unity that no one denomination could. And the language of natural law or inherent or inalienable freedoms or self-determination mixed with all of these colonial uh, religions was the crux of the American Enlightenment. And this paved way for the American Revolution. And this is where I'm going to read one of my favorite stories. No, I have not read this entire book. Don't be too impressed. I've read excerpts. But there's a great story in here from the First Continental Congress. So American Revolution, not a lot needs to be said there. England, uh, King George, and Parliament were taxing the colonies without representation. They were violating their rights as Englishmen. The easiest way that I've found to explain it to my students is that King George III was saying, he was speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He was saying, you're English citizens and you're English subjects, and therefore you have to do what I say. I'm, I'm your sovereign, you have to obey the sovereign. But on the other hand, you're only colonists, and therefore the rights of Englishmen don't apply to you. And what was happening in America is, if you were living in America in the 1760s, 1770s, and you're an adult, you're an English citizen. But chances are, you've never been to England. Very likely, your parents have never been to England. Very likely, your grandparents have never even been to England. And it's it's certainly possible that your great-grandparents have never been to England. Well, what does that all mean? That means we're four, three, four, or even five generations of, of having been born and raised on the North American continent, and whatever colony you happen to live in, that is what you have been accustomed to doing, to, to, to living in for all those generations. So you, don't, you have an affinity to England, but you really identify as a Massachusetts person, or as a Virginian, or as a Pennsylvanian. Okay, and the other, the other big thing about that is that these people had been given self-rule for all those generations. Their colonial charters had, had granted them the ability to have um, uh, self-government. In Massachusetts in particular, they had this thing called the town hall meeting. We have our town hall meeting every year at Dayspring. We get all of our names from colonial stuff. We're just old fashioned like that. The new building is gonna look like a colonial building, okay? We, we really love the whole, that whole time period. We, we think there's a lot there. But um, uh, so, so generations of self-government and generations of really being having an attachment to, to my local community and not to King George III 3,000 miles away, and then all these violations begin happening, and that's kind of the background here for what happens in the American Revolution. A number of things happen. We don't have time to get into all of them, but in 1774, uh, there, was, there was a call for a Continental Congress for all 13 delegates to convene in Philadelphia to try to, quote, recover our rights. That was their purpose. They wanted to get together and they wanted to talk about what was happening primarily in Boston, Massachusetts, and they wanted to try to find a peaceful way to get the king's attention, to say, we are your citizens, we want to be good subjects, we want to honor you, we want to honor God, but you can't keep treating us this way. So that was the purpose of the convention. But before they could even get together, they had trouble because they were politicians. They were all lawyers. They were all bright men. They all wanted to be able to give a speech and uh, have every other man think that he was a great man. John Adams wrote a letter to his wife and described the scene of the first time the Congress met. He said, when, con when the Congress met, Mr. Cushing first made a motion that it should be opened with prayer. It was opposed by one or two because we were so divided in religious sentiments. Some were Episcopalians, some were Quakers, some were Anabaptists, and some were Presbyterians, and some were Congregationalists. He said, we could not agree in the same act of worship. So the very first thing that they do after getting together is, we need to open this with prayer. And what happens right away? They start arguing about which minister should open them in prayer because they had so many different denominations present. Don't you just love being a Protestant? I mean, it reminds me of like, I, I grew up Baptist, so it reminds me of some of the church business meetings we had and the debates about what color the new carpet should be. Is that just, is that just me or anybody? Okay. Oh. I was Southern Baptist, what can I say? 
Mr. Samuel Adams rose and said he was no bigot, and he could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend to his country. He was a stranger in Philadelphia, but he had heard that a Mr. Reverend Duché uh, deserved that character, and therefore he moved that Mr. Duché, an Episcopalian clergyman, might be desired to read prayers to the Congress tomorrow morning. The motion was seconded and passed in the affirmative. And so the next day, Mr. Duché came. He said, you must remember this was the first morning after we heard the horrible rumor of the cannonade of Boston. So that's the Battle of Bunker Hill. A thousand Americans were killed. And they're hearing about this for the first time. I never saw a greater effect produced upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read on that morning. It has, an, it had an, it has had an extended, I'm sorry, it has had an excellent effect upon everybody here, and I must beg you to read this psalm. So the reverend opened with a psalm. It was Psalm uh, 31. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me. And he goes on to read the whole psalm. So picture the very first official meeting for what became the United States of America is being opened with the reading of the 31st psalm and then the reverend spoke out an extemporaneous prayer. And that's a big deal because Episcopalians read their prayers. It's very formal. They write their prayers out and then they read them. This guy just prayed in the spirit, you might say. He said, uh, John Adams is writing to his wife, he said, after this, Mr. Duché, unexpectedly to everybody, struck out into an extemporaneous prayer which filled the bosom of every man present. I must confess, I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced, Episcopalian as he is. Dr. Cooper himself never prayed with such fervor or such ardor or such earnestness. Uh, and so I'm gonna read you the prayer. He says, O Lord, our heavenly Father, high and mighty King of kings and Lord of lords, who dost from thy throne behold all dwellers on earth and reignest with power supreme and uncontrolled over all the kingdoms, empires, and governments, look down in mercy, we beseech thee, on these American states who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor and thrown themselves on thy gracious protection, desiring to be henceforth dependent only on thee. To thee, they have appealed for the righteousness of their cause. To thee do they now look up for that countenance and support which thou alone canst give. Take them, therefore, Heavenly Father, under thy nurturing care. Give them wisdom and counsel and valor in the field. Defeat the malicious designs of our cruel adversaries. Convince them of the unrighteousness of their cause. And if they still persist in their sanguinary purposes, O oh, let the voice of thine own unerring justice sounding in the hearts constrain them to drop the weapons of war from their unnerved hands in the day of battle. Be thou present, O God of wisdom, and direct the counsels of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things on the best and surest foundation that the scene of blood may be speedily closed that order, harmony, and peace may be effectually restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish among thy people. Preserve the health of their bodies and the vigor of their minds. Shower down on them and the millions they here represent such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world and crown them with everlasting glory in the world to come. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. So, the first official act of business from our Congress was that prayer. That's pretty cool. At least I think so. Um, providential stories. I need to move fast. George Washington is made general of the army, and we're fighting a war against Great Britain. There's a couple of times, I'm going to pick a few examples here, where I don't think you can draw any conclusion other than God intervened. Uh, one of the first stories of this, so I'll fast forward to 1776. Uh, the British are in Boston, and Washington has been sent to try to liberate Boston and get the British out of there. So this is before the Declaration of Independence is written, but it's one of the things that will cause, cause Congress to go ahead and, and do that. Uh, Washington has Boston surrounded, and the British are in the town of Boston, and they feel like they need to 
uh, cross the harbor and attack Washington's troops and send them, and send them away. Um, and so they try to do that. And I'll read you this account here. During the, during the early spring of 1776, with the British in control of Boston, Washington ordered cannons brought uh, through the snow from Fort Ticonderoga to fortify Dorchester Heights overlooking Boston Harbor. Seeing the danger, British General Howe ordered an, an amphibious assault on the American position. However, the night before the assault was to begin, quote, a hurricane or terrible storm, a southeaster of gale proportions, end quote, hit the Boston area and disrupted Howe's plans, so he called off his attack on the American position due to the badness of the weather. That's a quote from the British officer. As a result of the sudden storm and the strength of the American position, commanding movement in and out of Boston Harbor, General Howe ordered the British troops to evacuate. Washington again wrote to his brother, quote, this remarkable interposition of providence is for some wise purpose, I have not a doubt. And an even greater story then, I told you about this at back to school night where the fog came in and hid the Americans. And there's one more great example here from the, what's, what becomes known as the Battle of Yorktown. So in the Battle of Yorktown, we are, it ends up becoming the climactic battle of the war. It's George Washington against General Cornwallis. They have, the, the Americans actually this time have the British uh, surrounded um, and they're working their way in, they're laying siege. Cornwallis is waiting on reinforcements to come and if those reinforcements come, the Americans aren't gonna be able to do anything uh, about this. So. In January of 1781, American General Daniel Morgan defeated an, ad an advancing British force under General Cornwallis at the Battle of Cowpens in South Carolina in what has been called a tactical masterpiece and turning point of the war. So this is a little bit of a build up to Yorktown. After the battle, Morgan retreated north, chased by the British. Cornwallis reached the Catawba River only hours after the Americans had crossed, but a sudden storm made the river impassable. The British nearly overtook the Americans at the next river, but again rains flooded the river, sh slowing the British, and another flash flood blocked the British at the third river, allowing the Americans to cross into friendly territory. British General Henry Clinton described these events as follows. He said, quote, here the Royal Army was again stopped by a sudden rise of the waters, which had only just fallen, almost miraculously, to let the enemy over, end quote. George Washington wrote in March of 1781, we have abundant reasons to thank Providence for its many favorable interpositions on our behalf. It has at times been my only dependence for all other resources seemed to have failed us. So leading up to Yorktown, the Americans had been running from the British. Three times they crossed a river. The water was at a low level for the Americans to cross. As soon as the Americans crossed, the water's level rose and the British could not cross it. And then, that's the prelude to Yorktown. The culminating battles of the Revolutionary War were so decisively influenced by the weather. In October of 1781, an inconclusive engagement between the French and the British fleets in the Atlantic Ocean, prolonged by shifting winds, allowed another squadron of French ships with troops and supplies to slip into the Chesapeake Bay, preventing the British supply ships from reaching Cornwallis who was surrounded by 17,000 French and American troops in Yorktown. Facing overwhelming odds, Cornwallis attempted a nighttime breakout by starting to ferry his regular troops across the York River. I put a little picture up here. I don't know if you can really tell what that is, but it's the York River there, I've been there before. If you ever go to Virginia, I encourage you to go to what's called the Colonial Triangle. It's Jamestown, Yorktown and Williamsburg. Really, really, all three of those places are really excellent. But if you go to Yorktown, you can go to the, to the battlefield there uh, where this took place and you can see this river is about as wide as what we deal with here at the Susquehanna. It's anywhere from three quarters of a mile to a mile uh, uh, wide at, at most of the points in this area. So I want you to just have that in your mind. This isn't the Conestoga River we're talking about. This is a big body of water, okay? Um, and Cornwallis is going to try to cross it, a, a nighttime breakout, by starting to ferry his regular troops across the York River. The first group made it safely across the river. However, a sudden and severe rain squall blew the second contingent of soldiers downriver. I stapled this poorly. 
leaving Cornwallis with much with a much reduced force. This sudden quote adverse turn of the weather completely disrupted the attempted breakout end quote. And as a British colonel commented, thus expired the last hope of the British army. Cornwallis surrendered the next day while a British military band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. The American victory at Yorktown has been called one of the most influential battles in history as it ended an eight year struggle for the independence and launched America on a path to becoming a world power. And it was aided by a sudden and dramatic change in the weather. So there's at least four significant occasions where uh, Americans are fighting against the British during the war and the weather turns very suddenly and it's always in favor of the Americans to help them either defeat or escape from the British. That's our heritage. That's part of our heritage. And love telling those stories to our students because they get to understand, you know, we... We can't say this for certain because it's not in scripture, but we can look at the events and make observations and say it sure seems like God was doing something in America at its founding. And even, even the enemies, the British officers would write back home many times frustrated and talking about how God kept changing the weather for the Americans' favor. So, those are some providential stories. I have a couple more things. <coughs> There's a really... Wow. Okay. I don't need them, but I'm afraid I'll slip and fall on them if I don't pick them up. So, one story here from the Constitutional Convention. If you uh, fast forward, the after the war is over, we've defeated the British, we've been given our independence, the first form of government that we had was called the Articles of Confederation. It was a nightmare, not working well at all. So in 1787, a constitutional convention was called where delegates from all the different states were, were, were going to come together and try to revise the Articles of Confederation. They ended up tossing the whole thing out and giving us the constitution that we have today. In the first five weeks of the deliberations, it was not going well. You had all these different men from different states who had their own interest and they were trying to represent their interest and bring the best deal home for their state. There was debates over the large states versus the small states. There was debates over where the nation's capital should be. There, was a, there were debates about what should the executive office look like. Should there be one person who's a president or should it be a body of seven people? That's the office of the presidency. They, and of course the slavery issue was a major contention point as well that nobody could agree on. North and South viewed that very differently. As the story goes, Benjamin Franklin, who was um, the elder statesman of the Constitutional Convention, this is his last great act as an American founder, he's 70 years old at the time, he has to be carried into the convention every day on a sedan chair because he has gout so badly in his feet he can no longer walk. Um, on this particular day, he rises to his feet. This is June 28th, and, it, and I'm going to read from this book. is called The Light and the Glory. Um, at this crucial moment, when there was not a person present who had any real hope of finding an effective solution, Benjamin Franklin rose to speak. He said, and I'm going to just read his speech. It's not that long. He said, In the beginning of the contest with Britain, when we were, when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. So the same room that they're in for the Constitutional Convention is Independence Hall. That's where the Congress met for the Declaration of Independence, and that's where they met during the war to try to govern during the war. And he said, we had daily prayers for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they were graciously answered. All of us who were engaged in the struggle must have observed frequent instances of a superintending providence in our favor. And have we now forgotten this powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, 
and the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. I firmly believe this. I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed <coughs> in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided in our, by our little partial local interests, our projects will be conf confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to the future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing government by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, or conquest. I therefore beg leave to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessing on our deliberation be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business. And that motion was seconded and it was adopted and every morning from that point forward they opened with prayer and we got the constitution that we have. Another cool story. All right, finally for tonight, I just wanted to, I, I thought there's, there's, as I said, volumes of, of stories of America's Christian heritage, whether we're talking about our colonial churches, whether we're talking about the pilgrims, whether we're talking about providential occurrences during the American War for Independence. Uh, I thought it would be good to kind of talk about some of the Christian symbolism that we saw at the beginning of our country that we still see, uh, uh, and some of these things we still see today. So first of all, the president and the federal officers, they swear in on the Bible. This was first started by George Washington. He placed his right hand on the Bible, he raised his left hand, and then he added, what, uh, what phrase, does, does anybody remember what phrase he added to the end of the presidential oath? It's not in the Constitution. I, George, what was it? So help me God, yeah. So Washington added that in as an ad lib, and every president since then has said, so help me God, as they have sworn in. I actually was talking about this today with my honors U.S. history students, and one of them said, uh, one of them asked me, have, um, what about the presidents who aren't Christians, or who haven't been Christians? And I need to look this up, I didn't have time this afternoon, but I believe that every president we've ever had has at least claimed to be a Christian. I don't think we've had a, a, a president who has been an, an, outs, um, an, an, an outward atheist. So every president that we have ever had has at least claimed to be a Christian and therefore taken no issue with swearing over the Bible and with saying, so help me God. And Washington actually bent down and kissed the Bible when he, when he finished his presidential oath. And here's another cool thing. Washington went and took communion after taking the oath of office. I have something else to read you. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but um, the first presidential inauguration included at least eight distinctly Christian, <coughs> I'm sorry, distinctly religious activities. One, there was a time of public prayer preceding the inauguration. Congress actually issued a law, or a, a, a decree, that said it would be pecu peculiarly improper to omit in the first in this first official act of my fervent supplications to that almighty being, uh, wait, that's the wrong thing. Sorry, I have the wrong thing. Congress declared that people should go to prayer at nine o'clock that morning and then proceed to Federal Hall where Washington would take the oath of office. Um, number two, the use of the Bible to administer the oath. Number three, solemnifying the oath with multiple religious expressions, placing his hand on the Bible, saying, so help me God, and kissing the Bible. Number four, prayers offered by the president himself in his address to Congress. Number five, religious content in his inaugural address. Number six, the president calling the people to pray to or, or to acknowledge God. Number seven, official church worship services. And number eight, clergy-led prayers. And these have been repeated in whole or part in every subsequent inauguration. So some Christian symbolism that we see at our founding that we still see a lot of times in, in modern day as well. There have been numerous congressional proclamations of thanksgiving uh, and, and or fasting. Our military has chaplains and our Congress has chaplains. How many of you knew that? I mean, our military having chaplains is pretty common, but Congress actually has chaplains as well. The U.S. Capitol building was used as a gathering place for church from 1807 to 1857. I really ticked off one of the Capitol uh, uh, tour guides last year when I brought this up, she, was, she wasn't happy with me. I, I didn't mean to do it, but I mean, I, I meant to do it, but I didn't mean to take her off. But you know, we're doing the Capitol tour and she, we're in the statuary, what they call now the Great Statuary Hall, 
which is where Congress used to meet at one point, and now, they, now it's, it's every state can send two statues of, of prominent people from their state. I think we have Robert Fulton and Ben Franklin might be our second one from Pennsylvania. Anyway, that same hall is also was used as a, as a place of gathering for worship. Washington, D.C. was a swamp. I mean, that's where the whole drain the swamp thing comes from because it literally was a swamp before they built it. And so um, they were still building some of the, they were still building the city in the early 1800s. The Capitol was one of the first buildings they built. It was the largest building at the, in the town at the time. And so churches took turns using the larger meeting rooms in the U.S. Capitol as a place to have church on Sunday mornings from 1807 to 1857. I brought that up and the tour guide was like, I'm not familiar with that. I don't think that's accurate. And I was like, hmm. I just let it go. I didn't want to argue with them in front of the students. I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I was like, oh, I'll just talk to my students later. And so when we were done with the tour, I pulled them aside. I was like, guys, come here. I was right. <laughs> and I can prove it. And uh, when we get back, I'll show you all the primary source stuff. I didn't want to be disrespectful, but, you know, anyway. All right. Um, <laughs> so God and Christian ideas are present in our founding documents. Uh, I'll talk about this next week. Next week is the perfect place to bring out some of those things. And God We Trust is on our currency. Uh, 1984, this was news to me until I started teaching. Um, 1984 was declared by Congress to be the year of the Bible. How many of you knew that? Ronald Reagan signed this. He said, of the many influences that have shaped the United States of America into a distinctive nation and people, none may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. Deep religious beliefs stemming from the Old and New Testament of the Bible inspired many of the early settlers of our country, providing them with the strength, character, convictions, and faith necessary to withstand great hardship and danger in this new and rugged land. And he goes on, says, Now therefore I, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States of America, in recognition of the contributions and influence of the Bible on our republic and on... Oh, I love that he didn't say democracy. Thank you, Ronnie. On our republic and on our people do hereby proclaim 1983, the year of the Bible in the United States. I encourage all citizens, each in his or her own way, to re-examine and rediscover its priceless and timeless message. Awesome. I'm a big Reagan fan, by the way. My history students all know that by the end of the year. I'm not ashamed of it. All right. He wasn't perfect, but he was pretty great. Uh, there are still yearly national prayer breakfasts that we still have, so that's a very uh, much of a, a modern example of some of the Christian symbolism that we have. And many presidents have publicly invoked God's name for his help and blessing. Abraham Lincoln was very uh, public about his, his asking God's help during the Civil War. FDR prayed over the radio on D-Day. How many of you were taught that in your history class? Did they play the prayer for you? Probably not. He prayed a long prayer the morning of D-Day over, the ra over a nationally um, uh, syndicated radio so that everybody in, in America could gather around their radios in their homes and, and listen to the president pray and ask God's blessing over what our troops were doing uh, on D-Day. Of course, he waited until the invasion started, which is smart, you know, intelligence, military intelligence and all that good stuff. So, so I, like I said, I've sprayed you down with a fire hose tonight, but I wanted you to see it, it's... Going back to the pilgrims, going back to the, f the, the original founding purposes of, uh, of almost all of our 13 colonies, the churches of the colonial era, the, the, the actual um, acts of God that took place during the war for independence, the, the belief of our founding fathers and their uh, unashamed calls for prayer to ask God to bless the work that we were doing. You know, it, it, it really... Many people do try to say that our country does not have a Christian founding, and you really have to work very hard to bury all this historical evidence to try to make that case. It's not even hard to find. So that's uh, our country's Christian heritage. <laughs>